thank you very much, Tim. Um, just to introduce ourselves to start off with, I'm Susan from Research and Innovation, and I support trust and foundation proposals from research aspect. Paula is from External Relations, and it's looking more from an infrastructure and community projects aspect. But we very often work together on trust and foundation proposals because there is an obvious crossover there. Um, briefly, we'd like to give you an overview of trust and foundations, um, who are the main trust and foundations, what you should be looking for, and maybe some top tips for success. Um, and hopefully we can add to what Tim was saying there, that we'd encourage you to actually go for trust and foundations maybe as your first option, not as the option of last resort because you haven't got funding from the research councils. There we go. So there are well over 8,000 trusts and foundations in the UK. So obviously worldwide there are going to be hundreds of thousands of millions if not more opportunities. Um, a lot of the European and trusts and foundations across the world might be eligible for UK applicants. Um, between them, the UK Trust and Foundations offer over £2 billion in funding. Now, this is quite a substantial amount and matches, if not more, than research councils and other public funding. The proviso with that is that the majority only give grants up to £5,000. So although there are ones out there that offer million pound infrastructure grants, most are going to be for small pots. So what's the difference between foundations and trusts? Well, most of them are charitable organisations and will be registered charities. A foundation tends to be something that has an income from endowment or lands and investment. So it might be somebody left a big investment in their will. And trusts are charities that might receive income through charitable funding. Now, more than likely, they're going to be both. So I dare say today you'll hear people talking about trusts and foundations and the crossover between the two. They support a very wide range of activities. Um, and different areas, academics, community projects, local councils, um, it's very wide and broad. But what we want to focus on today more is the smaller trusts and foundations. So who are the big guns? Now you might recognise some of these organisations. Um, they're very well known sources of funding. So we've got the Leverheim Trust. They fund a broad range of projects. Um, they don't have a very good well, they don't offer funding for medical funding, so for drug companies, anything that's got a direct clinical application, but otherwise, very broad. Um, the Wellcome Trust has a very similar remit to the Medical Research Council, but also has a lot of um, opportunities in medical humanities and public engagement. The British Academy focuses on social sciences. The Cancer Research and British Heart Foundation are put up there as examples of disease-based charities, However, they don't necessarily concentrate on cure and prevention. So you might be looking at rehabilitation, psychological aspects of diseases that might not be in those disease areas, but are generalisable to other subject areas. These particular foundations are very research focused and provide research grants that you'll recognise from the research councils, fellowships, research projects, um, network grants. And their underlying principles and structures for proposals are very similar to this. But now Paul is going to talk about some of the smaller foundations and how you might approach applying to them. So what do these trusts and foundations actually like to fund? As Susan said, there's thousands of them out there with millions to give away. It sounds really obvious, but obviously researching the trust that you want to apply to is key because it's really important that your project's a good fit and it's not going to be thrown out straight away. Funding, as you know, can be a very competitive process, so they're really looking for good value for their investment in much the same way that any public funder would be. They tend to like multidisciplined projects, and they'll be looking to see buildings of teams and partnerships, so try to bring that out in your application. They're really big on innovation. They like moving things forward in new ways and with new groups of people. And impact is a word that you'll hear time and again when it comes to funding applications for trusts and foundations. So don't be open-ended in what you're talking about. Be specific, have a specific time scale, and talk to them about how you can make quick wins. They also like to support the type of project that the research councils won't, and often that will be a prerequisite when we read about the eligibility criteria. 
They like to support very specific groups, and often these are marginalised people, and they like you to be person-centred in the way that you put your application together. And evaluation is another key area, so be really clear on how you'll carry out that evaluation. Bring that out in your application. So what are the pros and cons of applying to these smaller trusts and foundations? Well, many of the smaller ones like to put an emphasis on funding unusual projects that would perhaps struggle to get funding from elsewhere. So it's definitely worth bearing that in mind. And what you will find that is, by and large, a much less scary process than applying to some of the big research councils. It will tend to be a quicker process that you can cut your teeth on, and it's very unlikely to be a lengthy two-stage process, which can feel quite scary at times. Trusts and foundations of the smaller type are often willing to take risks on projects, but your case must be really compelling. We know that topics move in and out of fashion, perhaps in the way that smoking cessation was very topical a few years ago. That isn't so important to the smaller trust or foundation, but it will be key to demonstrate the need for your project and be innovative in the way that you're thinking about it. What you'll find is that many of these smaller trusts don't really exist online, they don't have their own websites. So there's an opportunity there to phone them direct, make contact with them early on and get on their radar. They'll also, you'll also find that they'll have a narrow field in many cases with sometimes a narrow geographic location, which is often a good thing because if they focus on Plymouth and you're in Plymouth, you're halfway there. On the not so good side, the things to bear in mind would be that they're not like the likes of the very rich Lever Hume and Wolfson foundations. You're often talking about grants of £100, £500 and £1,000. Also bear in mind that they're unlikely to fund your day-to-day -day costs of the estate type costs that you will come up against. And while it might be a good thing that they state that they don't have a specific deadline for your application, what you might find is that the Board of Trustees only meets once a year, so it's worth checking that out from the beginning. What you don't want to find is that you're going to have a very long wait for your answer. It's better to know sooner rather than later when the trustees will meet and when you're likely to get a decision from them. Okay. So I'd love to be able to give you a case study today of um, one of our success stories, but obviously we haven't got time. But one of the things that Plymouth University is very good at is Leverhulme Trust applications. So there's a brief overview of some of our most rec recent successful applications. So we range from Simon's um, study on Arctic ecosystems through to John's study on Dancers' Minds. Um, you can see the overall success rate for Leverhulme is around 12%, but it's worth looking at other opportunities such as visiting professorships where the success rate is a lot higher. Um, also with our small trusts and foundations, Plymouth University has a very good track record. Um, again, you can see the broad range there, and from what Paula was saying, um, we do have a lot of success obviously in areas in Devon and Cornwall where we're based. We've got the competitive advantage for that. Um, some things to think about before you get started with your application, because planning ahead is obviously going to be key to your success. Read the eligibility criteria and then read it again. What you don't want to find is that you've put in hours and hours of work only to find that your project's ineligible for whatever reason. Some of the trusts like Esme Fairbairn, Wolfson and so on have quite strict criteria about how many times a certain organisation can apply for funding within a year, one year time frame. <coughs> so it is worth checking out whether other, other applications have gone in because you don't want to be wasting your time. Be sure to follow your organisation's agreed processes for putting in funding applications. Costings are obviously really important. And if, you're, if the money that you're applying for requires matched funding, do ask about that from the outset and not as an afterthought. You need to know where it's coming from and when. So our top tips for success would be to research the trust thoroughly, look for shared aims and build a sense of unity. Always remember that the, he the funder wants to be the hero of the piece, so show them how their funding will make a difference. Talk to them early, get on their radar, involve partners, Really make sure your passion comes across. They get hundreds of applications, many of them very, very dry. So make their life more exciting, make yours interesting, include case studies, demonstrate the need, include quotes, really bring your application to life. It will make a difference. And look further ahead. Think about sustainability. What will happen after your project money runs out? Where will it go from there? Show them that you've really thought it through all the way through the process. Okay. Right, a few rapid slides now. 
Um, for advice and guidance, we recommend going to the research and innovation web pages. So, if you can, um, external partners can access this as well. So, if you go through the extranet, research and expertise supporting research. So, we can recommend looking at that for some help. Um, we'd recommend for our academics to sign up for a research professional. This will help you define some of the research, um, the trusts and foundations that hold research grants. <coughs> But, mostly, as a trade secret, we'd like you all to sign up for Funding Central. This is a free um, database. You can set up alerts for trust and foundation um, opportunities that are coming up. They've got seminar information on there. Um, it's a very good source of information. And the other good thing with this as well is they have trust and foundations that don't have websites. So you wouldn't find them through Research Professional or through a Google search. So we'd recommend having a look at that one. Okay, so those are our contact details. If anybody <laughs> would like to um, talk to us about trusts and foundations, and we'd be happy to meet with you and have a chat. Okay, thank you.